Hi again, everybody. Welcome into another edition. This is Cross Functionality, the show connecting coaching, baseball, softball, male, female, hosted by former college baseball and softball players. Thank you for joining us today. Episode 37, we're talking about Athletes Energy. Athletes Energy Management System is the title of today's episode. So let's get into it. Let me bring in friend, co-host, softball national champion at the University of Alabama and current day renowned coach. She's been She's in her basement, in the, her parents' basement today. <laughs> She's been confined to the basement today. Cassie yes. Riley Bosha, what's going on? Nothing. Uh, just get to come home and visit my parents. This is actually in the middle of an Alabama softball game right now. Mm -hmm. So trying to trying to catch glimpses of the score every now and then. <laughs> yes, of course. What's the score right now? By the way, oh. bad bad guys are winning six nothing. The bad guys are winning six mm -hmm. to nothing. Mm -hmm. And who are the bad guys? LSU. Okay. I mean, usually I refer to anybody that's playing the team I'm rooting for as the bad guys. Mm -hmm. <laughs> LSU, by the way, they speaking of the bad guys, they have the most, uh, I think, transfer portal athletes in their system overall. Really? That's Especially surprising. with baseball, though. Huh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. I'm not really all that surprised by it. Did you see the story? Did we talk about this last week? Did you see the story about Vanderbilt and their baseball program, how they still up to this point have not recruited from the transfer portal? Did you see that? I, okay, so I didn't see that. I think I saw the coach saying that they weren't going to let their athletes utilize NIL stuff. I don't. So I might have read that might be it too. Well, no, anyway, hand in hand. Well, so yeah, so they didn't. This is just on the baseball side for Vanderbilt right now mm -hmm. at, the, at this very moment as we speak. Talked about this, I think, on the lab two weeks ago as well. They have not recruited, and actually, and you mentioned LSU in today's show. Jake said, well, LSU's the number one team in the country baseball-wise right now. I get that, but I'm saying that Vanderbilt's like one of the best baseball programs mm -hmm. of all time. I don't know what their soft – do they have a, so, uh, a good softball program? Vanderbilt does not have a softball program. I didn't – okay, I didn't okay. – Which is, which is so. wild that it's same – it's it's them in Miami yeah. have like storied baseball programs but no softball version of it. So Vanderbilt baseball then hasn't recruited from the transfer portal. I don't know if, if – Mur is Murph doing anything with the transfer portal that you know of? Uh, yeah, I mean, this past offseason, they had a few people come in through the portal. Um, mm -hmm. I think that is kind of the way um, that the sport is going. And I think actually the reason Murphy has remained relevant is because as the sport has changed so much, he has, like many other coaches in NCAA softball, kind of progressed with um, with what the t how the tide's turning. But I think with baseball, it's kind of been a certain way for a lot longer. Softball's a little newer. It's on the scene a little le more recently. Um so I could see there being a little bit more of a, a hold on, like, this is not how we do things, you know? Well, did you see the story with college, ba at least college baseball recruiting rules now? It was a story in Baseball America this week with Teddy Cahill, and he talked about how the NCAA, the council, has passed a, a rule prohibiting certain times when you can and can recruit and can't recruit players on the baseball side. because I some think they're piggybacking the softball rule. That's been like okay. that for the last couple of years. Okay, because baseball players have been, and like softball, right, they've been being recruited by the time they're in middle school. And now eighth grade, they're getting yeah. recruited. And a lot of coaches don't like to do that. And I said this, I remarked about this on the Lab Epstein Hitting Podcast this week. I, I Coaches don't like to do this. Number one, they don't have the scholarship money that people think they do. But number two, they don't like putting a ceiling on a kid, baseball or softball, when they're still going through the growing stages, 13, 14, 15 years old. It's very hard to recruit a kid, but they feel that peer pressure almost of, I have to recruit this kid. I have to offer this kid or else somebody's going to snatch it up. It's the fear. It's the FOMO effect, right? The fear mm -hmm. of missing out. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad these rules are now in place on the baseball side. I think it's going to help a ton. It certainly has a uh, steady softball. Softball was, uh, committing girls at age 11 and 12 or sorry, age 11, but she was turning 12 next week. So it wasn't so bad. And, you know, I went to the convention NFCA convention one year and I was just picking a couple of coaches brains. Just the recruiting uh, topic came up a lot. And there were multiple coaches that said, if this continues, I'm going to have to leave this sport because morally I know I'm doing a massive disservice to these young kids yet. I feel like I have to for my job. And I never thought I was going to be in that position. And it, really did seem like there was going to be a lot of coaches that just were like, we're hurting these, these girls in a lot of ways by putting this pressure on them so early. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm glad that the changes are there because it has worked really well for softball. It's a lot different. When, when, when did you start getting recruited sophomore year? 
Well, um, or when did you start the, getting the letters? Remember, now you don't really get September letters September 1st of my right? junior year was the first time I ever got a letter from anyone. Okay. September 1st of my junior year. And mm-hmm. it was really a four to six month process. And then it was done. Right now, they're ranking girls at age 12. And yeah. I feel like the second you start to rank, I even, you know, I get parents who are like, you know what, Oklahoma takes the top this, this, and this every year. And, and, and the SEC takes girls ranked here. And it's really important for her to get this ranking. And I'm like, she's not in high school yet. You know, I so know. even though yeah. colleges haven't reached out, there's still that pressure that, you know, at least exists with with some athletes and some coaches. I'm not saying all, but there's definitely a, a heavier weight that comes with playing our sport um, now than it did 15 years ago. Well, I don't think, do coaches even send letters anymore? Or do they just reach out on, I would think they would reach out on Instagram uh, or Twitter. Do, do you know what? Um, I, I still see like posts, like people holding up, like, like, Oh, I just got this in the mail. And it's like a, um, it's not, it's not like a letter. It looks like, like some, something else came in it. Like maybe, I don't know, but it's like this big envelope with Mm -hmm. a Florida state logo or a Duke logo or Clemson. So I know there's still physical stuff being mailed. Who was the first school that, that sent you a letter? Uh, Dartmouth and I had never Dartmouth. Dartmouth's an Ivy league school. It's yeah. right near. Funny story. You mentioned that. Near... Sorry. I have to say that my aunt went to Dartmouth. There you my go. Aunt Jen went to Dartmouth. She's now well, a doctor. For some it reason, not. I, it yeah. didn't click when I read it. I was like, so in shock that I got a letter and I called my mom and I was like, I just got a letter from Dartmouth. Have you ever heard of them before? And she's like, Dartmouth. She's like, Dartmouth. <laughs> she's like, are Dar- you kidding said- me? <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. So the letter, what was it? A generic letter or was it? Hey, we're it was really a little more specific. It was okay. It had, so no. it actually was kind of addressed to you because yes. there's those generic letters that go out that might want you to come to a camp or might be interested in just getting their name out there as a school. Yeah, you know? it is interesting because as you, I always tell athletes this, I'm like, Hey, when someone, when a college sends you a letter, are you able to tell when it's kind of just been mass copy and pasted and mailed out? And they're like, Oh yeah, for sure. Like they're trying to get yeah. us to come to a camp. I'm like, so why are you doing that to coaches? Because so many times our athletes will copy and paste a generic, like, hi, my name is Cassie Riley Bush and I play for this team. And it's like, there's nothing personal about, I'm really interested in the University of Alabama. I appreciate the way you guys play. I've been watching, like, there's nothing personal about it. But when you receive that personal message from a coach, you're like, whoa, like they took the time. They know things about me, you know? So I always explain that to athletes when they're going through that recruiting process, just how empowering like five personalized messages are that you spend a little bit more time on than trying to send out 30 blanket emails that are like, Hey, here's a generic copy and paste dear coach. <laughs> yeah. I would love to know from Murph. Uh, I got to ask, ask him this sometime. How many DMS he probably receives or he gets on Instagram mm. from prospective players or players who want to play for him? I wonder, I mean, Twitter too. That is a good question because he yeah. is, not you know he he's has one of the more he has one, he, he's the top of the, one of the more renowned programs in the entire country it's been like yep. that for a decade right yeah, since you've been there and even active before on that. social media too like there's definitely right. coaches yeah. who are not as active he's very active on social media so i think that probably attracts more interaction with him yeah that, that is interesting yeah I, I would love to know that um from him i'm gonna have to reach out and ask him mm-hmm. just, just for show and they're just curious purposes because I mean, he has to, because you, you mentioned there, there's probably tons of kids, softball players, prospective softball players who want to play at the next level, who send these, I don't know what letters or, or resume tapes, whatever you want to call them on field resume tapes out to these coaches. But now it's so much easier to get in touch with these coaches if they do indeed have social media. And if they're as active on social media as Murph is, he's again, very active on both. I see it on Twitter, on Instagram, on Instagram, he has each game listed of when they're playing, what time yep. they're playing that day, which is really cool too. Yes, yes. Yeah, no, he's, uh, again, another product of him catching up with the times. Yeah. You know? Yeah, he's good. He's good like that. Very good. All right, um, mm-hmm. let's get into today's topic. Episode 37, Athletes Energy Management System. Very important. You know, sleep and hydration. You, you listed off points um, on our preparation sheet uh, prior to the show. Um, we're going to get to all of them today, but I I think the two that stick out to me the most, and I think one I struggle with the other one, I'm, I'm a master at sleep. (laughs) I struggle with hydration. I don't, I drink Mm. about, for those who don't know, I drink about 150 ounces of water a day. I weigh 170 pounds. Take that for what it is. Mm -hmm. That does not include the coffee or the green tea either. I only have about one or two cups of coffee a day, but water wise, I drink a lot of water. So hydration, I don't, I don't struggle with sleep. Mm. 
I don't really struggle all that much with, but as you get older as an, and you know, this, right, you get older, your sleep cycles are a little bit off. Now as an athlete though, those two are, in my opinion, are the most important sleep and hydration. If you don't have the proper sleep or the sleep cycle, and you don't have the proper hydration. Number one, by the way, too, with hydration, uh, a couple of things that I, I did some research on. If you don't have proper hydration as an athlete, um, it's the, there's a reduction in blood volume, decreased sweat rate, increased core temperature. None of them are good. So, uh, Cass, here's what I got from hydration. And for athletes out there, my little piece of advice of the week, divide your body weight in half. And drink at least an ounce per pound of your body weight. And you can stay hydrated as an athlete. But sleep and hydration, arguably the most important of all of this. For sure. Um, and I think, you know, I think, too, it's it's what you just said. It's, it's preparation and management. We can't just passively go about the foundation of our recovery or our energy management, if you will, by yeah. just saying, like, oh, I go to sleep every night and I drink some water every day and it'll just work out. You know, we don't go about our weightlifting like that. We don't go about our hitting like that. We're very meticulous. We try to follow plans. And yet sometimes the two lowest hanging fruits of fruit of uh, sleep and hydration, we yeah. kind of just let let sail along with us. Um, so to go off hydration, I think that's that's a great start. Uh, it's certainly going to be a little bit different for everybody. Um, if I'm specifically speaking to females, especially females right around that prepubescent and pubescent ages, um, right around their period when they're when they're starting their cycles, right around their period, you're going to start to notice like you feel way worse. It's way more difficult to recover from workouts during those phases. And the recommendation is to increase your water intake during the, that like eight to 10 day period of time. So I know it's, you know, sometimes we don't like talking about it, but it is so impactful. It's a week out of our entire uh, month. And then, so we get 12 weeks a year. If we just ignore how to extra recover during those times, we're going to probably fall behind a good bit. Um, so there are going to be certain times where hydration is higher. If you're traveling on planes to weekend tournaments, uh, that's going to dehydrate you. You need to probably uptick it a little bit more then. And then just as the weather gets warmer, we sweat a little bit more. We're going to need to uptick that hydration a, a decent bit. But the idea is to, if you're going into a game and you're trying to uptick your hydration a couple hours before, it's that's not when you do it. The, the time to hydrate for that game needed to happen in the 24 to 48, 48 hours leading into that. So it's definitely a consistency thing you're trying to figure out other uh tactics to stay consistent we've definitely talked a lot about that in the past but mm -hmm. um making sure we don't get into too big of a deficit uh with that is 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 for sure one of my my biggest recommendations what was your workout schedule like by the way in college when did you guys lift what time of day um so in the off season uh anywhere from 6 to 6 30 was our start time that was mm -hmm. three days a week uh hour and a half lifts and then tuesday and wednesday were strict conditioning days um those were either those are in the afternoon around four o'clock. Uh, yeah. So if anyone knows what 4 p.m. in August and September is in Alabama outside, mm. it's not cold. <laughs> by any no, means. it's not pleasant either. That's like that was like mid to upper 90s and humidity was high. And so when mm. you're humid that, you know, when you talk about core temperature so many times, your ability to just complete work, like even if it's in practice, I know we don't play a conditioning based sport, but we play a sport that we need to last for five hours at sometimes. Um, so when your core temperature gets high and you can't cool it off, that's when you start to feel those adverse effects of the heat of poor hydration, whatever it may be. So it's, it's staying on top of, you know, there's, there's plenty of reasons why you want to be hydrated, but like that is that to me was one of the biggest ones was just yeah. like, okay, my performance is going to suffer next week potentially because I'm lacking on this right now. So, so you guys, cause I'm all, I, I asked the question about when you guys used to lift. I, I'm of the school now, as I've gotten older, maybe it's cause I have gotten older that I need the proper amount of sleep. And if I plan on waking up early in the morning to go work out, but I don't feel like I got enough REM sleep or I don't, or I feel tired when I get up, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to push it back till later in the day until I have the energy or my energy levels mm. are up so I can get a good workout in. And so I wonder if there's a myth buster in there when it comes to sleep and athletes and waking up early when you're in college to go lift. And I understand that there's a lot of teams that have to lift and everybody has a schedule, but I just, I do wonder, and it's on the athlete too, to get their proper sleep. But it's a hard grind when you have to get up at least three days a week, say five, five thirty in the morning and go get a really good workout in and go lift. It's very hard to do. And you know, sometimes this I think is, that might deplete the energy levels. Yeah. This is such an interesting um, topic. And I think, 
you could bounce back and forth. You're going to have some schools of thought where people are like, no, 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 we need to let these athletes sleep. And you have other schools of thought where it's like, you're going to have to do hard things and figure out how to get your body to still work efficiently, even when you don't feel at your best. And this is a great time to practice it. Right. So, um, I think, uh, I think a couple of things. So, uh, I listened to Florida state coach talk one year. It was the year right after she won the national championship with her team. And I asked, or I didn't ask her, obviously, uh, the reporter asked her, Hey, what do you think made the biggest difference in your team this year? And mm-hmm. I think I've mentioned this before, but she talked about the whoop band, which is a yep. device you wear on your wrist. It, it, I mean, you think you can wear it on your ankle. You could wear it in a lot of different areas now, but it's essentially measuring like, Hey, how was your recovery? How was your sleep? Um, for instance, you could have really great sleep, but really horrible recovery. And that's an example of hormones taking an effect on you, an example of your hydration or nutrition taking a bigger effect on you, right? So right. Um, they basically utilize that where it's like, all right, our, our team as a whole's recovery is terrible right now. We need to lay back a little bit. Maybe we give them off for weights and have them lift later in the day. Or our team as a whole is really struggling. Um, maybe we need to take a day off of practice or, or you know, at the hotel let them sleep in when we're on the road, whatever it may be. I just thought that was a very interesting tactic that that program utilized in Florida state. If anyone knows has been uh, a tremendous powerhouse in softball for, for a good bit of time. So yeah, I am, I am torn with that. Um, Sometimes waking up feeling like crap, getting yourself to the weight room and then being with your entire team lifting together and realizing you're training to try to win a national championship. There was no better high like I felt amazing after those. And it was, it was a little bit of teaching discipline. It was a little bit of, you know, sometimes you get your ass kicked when you don't have a good night's sleep and that's a good lesson to learn, you know? So yeah. I, I am torn with that. I, I don't love the idea of like, okay, you're going to lift separately just based on how your sleep schedules work. Um, because shoot, you could then get into, there are some people that are just night people and some people that are morning people. Like, why are we uh, forcing these people who are more productive at night and less productive in the morning to cater to a morning schedule. So I don't know. It's, it, it, it's an interesting conversation. I, based on experience, I would, I would lean towards, um, getting that lift in early with everybody. Maybe it doesn't have to be at 6am, but I don't know. There's something special about getting after it when everyone was still sleeping. I don't disagree. I'm going to give a, <laughs> I'm going to give a little hack though for everybody. Can I give a little yeah. hack today for sure. athletes hack if you will? Go for it. Okay. If you wake up tired and you do have to go lift or you want to still go lift, if you think you have that discipline, you can get out of bed even if you're still tired or your body feels tired. Drink 30 ounces of water, chug it, followed immediately by your pre-workout, athletes legal pre-workout, okay? I don't know if Celsius is is Legal. I don't know either. I think it's, I think it's allowed, but it's okay. That's, that is a debatable product sometimes. <laughs> so whatever, well. whatever, whatever energy drink that's legal or pre-workout that's legal immediately drink that afterwards. And now you're set up for your workout now at 11 o'clock in the morning, 12 o'clock in the afternoon. I'm not promising anything. <laughs> <laughs> so the lesson here, drink a lot of water prior to working out if you're tired and get your sleep. Mm. What are, yeah, you know what? Um, I just some athletes, I can tell you other little hacks that we tried. Um, I needed a little bit of time. I would actually wake up kind of 40 minutes earlier because I knew I needed some type of food or some type of drink or that, that it just took me a little bit longer sometimes to wake up and I was fine waking up earlier. I wanted that time beforehand. I had some athletes who, uh, wanted as much sleep as humanly possible would sleep in their weightlifting clothes for the next morning so they could wake up and just go. Um, Some people took showers, cold, cold showers to wake them up, followed by hot. So that's kind of like a cold, hot treatment. Um, And then, you know, it's I think caffeine consumption is either just talked about more or just more prevalent. I don't know exactly, but I don't remember anybody on my team having pre-workout or caffeine prior to their workouts. It, You know, which is interesting because I feel like that's a lot that like pre-workout is a big part of working out and there's even a lot of positive research as to like, Hey, when you do have pre-workout, how much better of a workout you could potentially have. So, um, yeah, it is. It well, is I've only been doing pre-workout, I guess, since I've been about 25. Yeah. I think it's, so I never did it as an athlete. I, yeah, I was, I actually didn't drink caffeine until I got done playing. Yeah. I, I, mm, I'm trying to think when I actually started drinking coffee on a regular basis. Probably around 25, 26 yeah. as well. It is a it yeah. is a very adult thing, like a hot cup of coffee. Now <laughs> it's a very, it's a very adult accessible in different forms. 
<laughs> it's a very adult professional thing. Um, so be sure to subscribe to the podcast as well, Apple, Google, Spotify, and watch us on the Softball Strength Academy YouTube page. Let's talk a little bit about time management versus energy management. Mm -hmm. Let's sure. talk a little bit about that here. Um, our title of today's episode is Athletes Energy Management System. Time management, energy management kind of go hand in hand. As an athlete, time management, kids, very important as an athlete. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I guess this was this was actually something that I don't think really hit me until um, I was super, super busy with my schedule one time. And I was so meticulous about um, my time management. And I only had 30 minutes at the end of my day to like really relax, like maybe 30 minutes in the beginning, 30 minutes at the end of my day. But I realized um, I was, I had felt so good about my day and, and I was happy with everything. I, I, there was nothing that was draining me. There was nothing that was extremely stressful. And I, those 30 minutes at the end of my day, although some people would have thought like, oh, only 30 minutes. Mm. I just, I was in such a better place to enjoy those 30 minutes. And I had other days where I did not have a packed schedule, but I was doing things that just either didn't align with um, either who I was or who I wanted to be, or they were massively stressful. Um, and I felt so depleted and, and down and out by the end of the day, I could have had three, four hours at the end of my day. Right. Um, and my energy was just shot. So it, it made me realize, okay, time management is great. Like we, it's not, it's not one or the other. It's yeah. just, it, they're not the same thing. We could have, you know, not every hour, not every minute is created equal. And when we are doing things that are sucking the life out of us, if we're surrounding ourselves with energy vampires, right? People who are all about drama or people who are just really not aligning with us, then all of a sudden our energy is going to feel very, very low. And it's not because you had a busy schedule. It could just be that you were not in the right place doing what you needed to be doing, let's say. So you're, you're talking emo stress. emotionally. Yes. That for your sure. energy. Yeah. 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 I agree with that. If you're mentally not in the right place, um, if you're emotionally tired, there's different for, I think there's different forms of being tired. Mm, if you're emotionally yeah. tired, we've all been there. It depletes your energy, no doubt about it in mm -hmm. every, a, every aspect. And it carries over to the physical energy and to the physical side of what you're trying to do. Oh, for sure. And I, I think you can bring that back to games, right? So yeah. you, you know, not all, all losses are created equal. You play against a team, um, that, shouldn't have beat you and they came and they kicked you in the teeth and you lost that game, you're going to mm -hmm. feel emotionally drained in a different way. Um, I certainly used to feel, you know, it's, it's cause it's cumulative stress on you. Right. So we'd be at the world series. We'd only play one game a day yet. I'd wake up the next morning. So immensely like just, I fe felt like I needed so much more time to kind of uh, wake up and go through my routine and harness my energy again um, because those were such energy depleting uh, events, you know? So I think just, it's, again, it's not a right or wrong. It's just bringing a little bit of awareness being like, huh, like when do I wake up feeling like, Oh, I really got my butt kicked versus you wake up and you're feeling a little bit better. You're able to move through your routine a little bit better. Or at the end of your day, you're noticing, okay, I, I feel like I've, I, I feel good. I feel like I still have something left in me, um, to be able to accomplish. Cause that is, I think also going to help you dictate some of how your workout routines might might work best for you um yeah anyway no i and i want to say too you know with it's not always a good night's sleep that you or a, a night's sleep in general that mm. can fix that emotional energy and a lot of that comes from fixing that emotional energy being around the right people be, away from those energy suckers you know because yeah they, they Any just mental you. health or mental performance stuff we talked about too, like the journaling, like you're, let's say you're trying to implement a new habit, like we talked about last week, and you're just yeah. trying to grind through this new habit instead of aligning it with your current habits. One is going to drain your energy way more than the other one. Um, I, I think that's for sure. Um, but yes, I mean, you brought up sleep and one of the, one of the things that whoop has really brought to light for me is I could get eight hours of sleep and there are some nights I am in 45 minutes of deeper REM sleep. And then there are some nights I get six hours of sleep, but I spent three and a half hours in deeper REM sleep. So it wasn't necessarily my total time. I know that's what we're so fixated on. Like everyone needs a good eight hours of sleep, but what was I doing in the hour before bed? Was I working late? Did I eat late? Did I have screen time late? Did I have an exceptionally stressful day? Was I interrupted during my sleep, right? Something as simple as even my dog, to hopping on the bed would wake me up. Right. I know the feeling. Exactly. <laughs> so, you know, and there's plenty of college athletes with dogs or whatever else, but like that interrupted sleep, um, you know, 
when we roomed in college, we roomed with all athletes. And I remember one of the um, RAs on the floor was saying like, yeah, this is actually really important because you, you wouldn't be sleeping much if you were, you were trying to align your sleep schedule with a typical college student sleep schedule. And I, you know, I'm thankful when I had to wake up for weights in the morning, I didn't have someone coming in from partying only a couple hours before I was waking up. Um, that would have made life a lot more difficult for sure. I agree. And Cassie, Cassie was a big partier in college, apparently. Still have never been to a college party. I'm just kidding. Of course. <laughs> You've never been to a college party. I, believe mm -hmm. I can't believe that. I was, you know what? I'm not like the most socially wanting to go out to parties anyway. I was good hanging well, you, out. You out, told, out, you out told the story. Stuff. You told that story, though, about how you guys used to get together at a house. Yes. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like our team. That way. Yeah. yeah. Watch a movie, eat dinner. So well, there well, you go. What was the genre of movie? I don't remember, but I remember my teammate, Kayla Bro, who is actually ESPN analyst right now. Um, and she had, she was like, Hey, have you heard of this thing called Netflix? And it was, you could mail <laughs> in to get, they were like physical DVDs that you would mail back and forth. <laughs> yeah. By the way, speaking of which I read this week that that's going away or it's already gone. You can't, yeah. they don't mail you DVDs anymore. You can't mail them back. It's just strictly yeah. digital now. So yeah. man, we're, we're, we're aging ourselves. Now. <laughs> that's okay. I remember when, because I, I do remember when Netflix was starting to, you know, come into play in 2008, 2009, and they had the, the Netflix had the, the big, um, they look like um, big boxes outside of, uh, not boxes, um, uh, you know, like the, the, where the, where usually when you get, where you get a soda or get a drink, a vending machine, a vending machine, yeah, right. Yeah, where yeah. It looked like, they look like they're, they're, they're basically big vending machines outside of a gas station or something. Red, red, bo a red box, I think it's red called box. too. Yeah, I think they red, have yeah. that. So it's like a one-day rental, and then if you pass by that one day, they bump it up. Yeah. I had a Blockbuster in my town, but I don't remember if we got DVDs or VHSs from Blockbuster. There's I think it was one, VHS. There's one Blockbuster left in the country. It's still alive. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Still alive. Um. So, by the way, here's a lesson for everybody, too. Blockbuster apparently had a chance to buy. Was it Netflix or was something else? They had a chance to buy. I think I saw that it was something, yeah. And they just said, no, it's, there's it's no value there. Digital age of, of media, not, never going to happen. <laughs> um, so, and we, of course, we fast forward now too to what dig the digital age of media is now. And this is why I'm not a cord cutter. I'm telling you because Netflix, is, their price has gone up. Hulu's price has gone up. Every, before you know it, I'm going to be paying a cable bill with all these streaming services. So there's no point in, in cutting cable. So anyways. I have not had cable in a very long time. Yeah, that's right. You're a stream. You're you're a court player. Um, yeah. Um. So what what about uh, the one question I have for you when you talk about being unprepared? How does that correlate with getting your energy depleted as an athlete as well? Is it more of a mental thing where you speed up your mind and that's depleting your energy? Uh, I think it can be that. It can also be decision making fatigue. So mm -hmm. um, if you the night before plan out your morning routine, you plan you write down your schedule. Number one, you're kind of making those decisions ahead of time. So that when you have when it comes to the moment, you're not deciding what you're wearing, you're not deciding breakfast, like you've already prepped those things. And it might mm -hmm. take you 15 minutes. And it, it seems daunting, but that 15 minutes is not that long to just plan out your next morning. And then all of a sudden you get through your routine and you haven't had to make all these little decisions. And, you know, um, actually I, I was listening to a broadcast the other day and I don't remember the exact numbers, but it was something like the average college, uh, athlete 40 years ago, 30, whatever it was, had to make something like an average of 15 decisions a day. And mm -hmm. now it's in the thousands and it's so, you know, so much of that has to do with our phone, but so much of that just has to do with the way life is like, there are so many more decisions that you you end up encountering in a day. So I think when you can kind of wake up and say, okay, like a lot of these are already taken care of and I can fluently move through them as if it's a routine or a habit and I don't have to consciously be like, huh, is it this or that, this or that, this or that, this or that all throughout your day, it's just going to feel very, very different. Um, you're going to feel like you're on top of the day instead of trying to play catch up one, two right. minutes behind. And that feeling of trying to play catch up, same thing as when you're trying to bat when you're down versus when you're trying to bat when you're up in a game is it feels very different you have a stranglehold on your day or a stranglehold in the game on the game rather than the other way around for sure yeah it's, that's not, the other way around is not good 
no, no. I think when you're trying to bat when you're down six nothing, it feels a lot different than when yeah. LSU is now batting when they're up. Actually, who knows? Maybe in the 30 minutes you've been chatting, Alabama's made this massive comeback, and I'll walk upstairs and, and see a, a, a good score for the good guys on TV. How what are, what's the average game time for softball? College uh, softball games. I just you know what I feel like I just heard it. It's it's under two and a half. It's like that two two fifteen. I feel like okay, right around there. It's not too bad. It's kind of what baseball is now. Mm -hmm. yeah. Some hitters are really struggling. Have you noticed that some hitters are really struggling with the new pitch clock? It's I, I'm curious how many people actually practice it. Like we knew this was coming, right? Yeah, I'm more. I'm curious how many people eat because you could practice it during your visualization time. I'm, you know, it's a necessity to adapt, even if you agree with it or not. And I'm, I'm surprised based on the professional nature of Major League Baseball that there's not more prepared hitters for that. I'm, I'm surprised too. Hey, did you see? I should have brought this up earlier, but did you see the or have you seen these new knobs that are puck like knobs on baseball bats now? No. They're I've very not. big. They're very big puck knobs at the end of the bats. Paul Goldschmidt is is a catalyst for using these. He's like hmm. oh, he's like the marketing head um, or marketing face for I think it's um, De Marini or Marucci or one of those, where he uses this bat that has a puck like. Uh, maybe I don't think this was a softball thing, but growing up there were some people that used to tape their knobs and just continue to tape the knobs to make the knob bigger. Well, the handle, the knob of the wood, these, some of these wood bats now that players are using at the major league level, they're puck like they're Why? in size. Yes. Oh, oh and, and what's the, what's the logic behind it? Uh, to balance out the bat and hmm. to gain more bat speed. Interesting. So yeah. is it, it, it adds weight to the knob. It adds weight, bounces, it adds weights to the, to the knob, so to the bottom I, of the I bat. And... Like, so there is a product called the hitting knob um, yeah. that, I've used for a little bit that has add some weight and I, for, especially for hitters who uh, can't seem to keep their hands tight to their body when they're swinging um, and they seem to cast, it just brings such a bigger awareness to like, Oh, I just cast it. Cause you have an extra 20 ounces on that knob to feel it. Mm -hmm. But what's in, so I, I feel like I've used it more as a corrective tool than I have used it as a progressive overload to, tool. Yeah. Um, but that is interesting for game like settings. I'm so curious now. So uh, my only thing is, I, maybe I'm just oh, just naturally skeptical of everything. So I like to question everything. Not that I don't like to evolve. My only thing with this is, and I don't think this is, a, I don't, see, I don't think it's really going to take off at all in softball because the bats are made differently. Right, right. Very different. Obviously. But with baseball, you may see this, you know, in, in next winter with players yeah. who walk into your academy with these big knobs mm -hmm. on their bat. My only thing is if you, scientifically, if you have a bat that say you, you're swinging a 34 ounce bat, right? And the bat is barrel heavy and you generate the bat quickness, the speed, the whip, all the science behind this hitting a baseball coming at you 90 plus miles per hour. Isn't that better than maybe balancing out the bat with this knob and my trying only, to gain bat speed that way? Yeah. So my only right? thought would be if that end weighted bat is not working for that particular hitter, they do prefer a more, evenly loaded bat and then you know this is this is, goes back to like one of the comments i made a long time ago is we when people go golfing they have this plethora of golf clubs to deal with the different environments that they're trying to produce with the ball mm -hmm. I, are we going to start to have a point where we have different bats depending on the type of bat we're, or, or excuse me, type of pitcher we're facing like higher spin rate guys are we going to use different bats like lower spin rate or people who are attacking lower in the zone are we going to use an end loaded bat versus an evenly loaded bat for high in the zone i I don't know. So maybe it's on par with something along those lines. They're trying to get a little advantage somewhere, but I'm going to have to look into a little more because I'm, I'm super curious. Yeah. It's going to be, it might be like fitted bats, like fitted golf clubs. Right. You know? Who knows? Who That'd knows? Be interesting. Um, before we wrap up today's show, episode 37, Athletes Energy Management System, be sure to follow us on social media at Jim Tara, at Coach underscore Cassie RB on Instagram, at Coach Cassie RB on Twitter. Do you have anything? as we wrap up today that we might've missed on athletes, energy management system, maintaining high um, energy levels as an athlete. I, I really do just think uh, it shouldn't be rocket science. We can attack really low hanging fruit, the quality yeah. of your sleep, um, wearing earplugs, uh, making a room completely dark, not viewing a screen before bed, having some type of sound machine, like all of those things have been proven to increase someone's quality of sleep. If you have a doctor, ask them about taking magnesium. 
Um, for some people, not for everybody, I'm not recommending this for everybody. Uh, magnesium has really helped with people's quality of sleep. So there's so many ways to, to really look at your sleep and try to improve that. And then for hydration, um, if you don't like carrying around a giant gallon of water, find out what works best for you. Um, I need a straw or else I'm just not going to drink as much water as if I don't have a straw. So uh, again, find out what works best for you and, um, you know, you <laughs> utilize how you're peeing as your guide. If your pee is completely clear, you're probably depleting electrolytes too much and you, you need an in-between. We don't want to overhydrate ourselves, but um, you can start to gauge in a, that's actually a very effective way to start to gauge like how much water intake you still need, especially when you need to uptick it a little bit more. Right. So if you're a female athlete, what would you recommend? How many ounces a day of water? Oh, uh, honestly, I, I have viewed so much that has varied that I have told athletes to really just look at their pee. I know that sounds okay. strange to say, but um, you're going to have, and I, I think too, like you could say, Hey, I want you to drink a gallon of water in a day. However, you drink it all in the first half of your day. It's not going to be nearly as effective as if you drink it throughout your day. Um, so I think the timing of it can matter as well. Um, okay. That's all. That's, that's all right. what I'm, my suggestion. All right. Very good. Again, be sure to um, subscribe to the podcast, Apple, Google, Spotify, new episodes every Wednesday at 9 a.m. And watch us on the YouTube page, Softball Strength Academy YouTube. Um, and email us your questions, jimbopodcast21 at gmail.com. Next week, you'll like this one, too. Competitiveness. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I personally like to win at everything. So. I hate losing so much. I know. It's and now I have children in my life and I need to dial it back sometimes and let them win a little bit. Cause no, they're four, no, do they're that. four. I know. No. And I catch myself and being like, they're four, they're four. I need to let them win sometimes and be okay. What with do it. you, what do you play with them? Are we talking, uh, shoots and ladders or what? Uh, I don't know. Like maybe it's like a video game. They're starting to get into some video games or like, I don't know. It's, it's like war, like just card game of war. Or oh, yeah, you can't like lose at war. I don't uh, care what age they are. Can't lose at war or rummy. One of them is learning chess. So anyway, we just need to okay. dial it back sometimes. <laughs> All right. I always want Cassie on my team. So if we're ever playing doubles ping pong, we can. You're on my team. Two, we'll, 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 we'll will ourselves to victory. All go. right, that's next week. Thank you for listening, everybody, and watching. Um, great episode today. If you have any questions? Email us again, Jimbo Podcast Twenty One at gmail.com. Reach out on social media, and we'll talk to you next week. <laughs>